Theater presents Ruth Hussey and Frank Lovejoy. From Hollywood, the Mutual Network, in cooperation with Family Theater, presents Old Friends, starring Frank Lovejoy. And now, here is your hostess, Ruth Hussey. Thank you, Tony Lafrano. Family Theater's only purpose is to bring to everyone's attention a practice that must become an important part of our lives if we are to win peace for ourselves, peace for our families, and peace for the world. Family Theater urges you to pray. Pray together as a family. And now to our transcribed drama, Old Friends, starring Frank Lovejoy as Bob. The only way you'll ever be able to see my point of view on this is by knowing what I was up against. You can kick around show business for a long time and get absolutely nowhere. In New York, you can go sit in Colby's and stretch a cup of coffee for over an hour, or stand around the bar in one of those spaghetti joints near Schubert's Alley, nursing a warm beer, hoping you'll meet some big operator. And you can do the same thing in Chicago or Hollywood. I wish I had half the money I've spent in spots like that buying lunch for the wrong people. <laughs> the point is that for jobs in show business, they don't run ads in the classified section of your local newspaper. You've got to go out and look for them. Well, I knew this and Kenny knew it. That's Kenny Lewis. He was the one who taught me eight years ago. So now I've got a little house in Glendale and I drive to work at the studio in a Ford convertible and things are looking up. And then one night a few months ago, the phone rings and Patty answers it and I get on the wire for a while and... Oh, brother. Oh, you bet. Yeah, you bet, Kenny. So long, kid. Holy cat. Is he out here? He just got off the train an hour ago. Well, I thought you said he was teaching dramatics in some little college in Michigan. Yeah, he was, but he quit. Oh, boy, oh, boy. Hmm. Does he have any prospects? Yeah, me. I'm his prospect. Oh, Bob. Oh, he saw the movie. Adaptation by Robert Ballinger. He thinks I own the studio. <laughs> well, you will. I'm not laughing. Hmm. Why is he here? Oh, the big chance. You've read his letters. He still wants to act? He's got $300. He's going to give it six months. The funny thing is that he's good. He was very good. And he helped me. Where is he staying? No way yet. A hotel. I'll steer him into a rooming house. Bob. He helped me, baby. I know. Eight years ago, he helped me. I can't pretend he's not here. I didn't get away from the studio until almost one the next afternoon. I'd played it a little big with Kenny. I said I'd meet him in the Hollywood Derby. Outside in the parking lot, I checked my wallet. Nine bucks and some change. That'd make it if we didn't go crazy. Kenny was waiting for me in one of the booths. He'd taken on a little weight. Bob. Who's the best writer in radio? Robert Ballinger, the best actor? Kenneth H. Kenneth Lewis. Lewis. Oh, you look great, Robert. <laughs> and hungry. And ain't it the truth? <laughs> And how's Patty? Oh, she's great. And this time you'll meet her. I'm looking forward to it. You know, you look fine, really, but where's the suntan? Snow place. That's a gag they have in this town. What's that? Well, if you're brown, you haven't been working. Really? Yeah. Well, what about location? Everybody wears hats. Hey, you look good. Oh, I feel okay. No, but seriously, uh... Is that bad, having a suntan? Well, I know one guy, a director. He goes swimming every morning off Santa Monica. Winter, summer, he goes swimming. Well? I think it's penance. <laughs> Is he brown? Yeah, yeah, but it doesn't hurt him. Everybody knows he's a director. Ah, that's the trick, huh? Yeah, that's the way it looks. <laughs> you ordered yet? Uh, no, no, no. I I'm not very hungry. Kenny, this is Bob. 
Okay. When I was strapped, you bought the strudel. Well, that was eight years ago. I got just as hungry then. Oh, we were kids. Oh, everybody in this business is kids. An adult couldn't stand it, no. Are we friends? I guess I sound like a jerk. Oh, you sound fine. Now, stop worrying. Look, if it wasn't for you, I'd still be knocking myself out trying to be a two-bit actor. You were good. I stunk. And you were the guy who told me. Right. So, thank you. <laughs> now, what do you want, a steak sandwich? Okay. boy. Now, stop worrying. We'll get your work. Well, are they pretty busy out at the, the studio? And it uh, stays open. My, uh, well, my deal is with just one producer. But there's plenty going on. Merrill. Yeah. He's the fellow who did that thing you saw my name on for the adaptation. Oh, I thought it was great. Really? I mean, seeing your name up on the screen. Well, that really gave me a kick. How'd you like the picture? It was good. Good. I was a little surprised to see your name on a Western, but I guess there's a big demand for that uh, formula stuff. Well, I'd hardly call a Western like Shane formula stuff. Well, let's face it, Bob, this wasn't Shane. <laughs> Oh, you guys from the campuses. If it doesn't have English subtitles and a downbeat ending, it's not art. You're from the campus. Yeah, a long time ago. And Shane didn't have English subtitles. You know, I'll bet you didn't know whether to like it or not until you read the Saturday Review. Oh. Oh, now, let me give you a little advice, Kenny. You know, most of the people out here think they're doing a pretty good job. I think most of them try to. Yeah, okay. And they've heard of Aeschylus and Shaw, but they're not in business to please the literary crowd. And the literary crowd is well aware of this. Hmm. Well, that might have brought down the house at the last faculty dinner, but out here it would lay an egg. Uh-huh. Would lay an egg with you? Well, we're not talking about me. We're talking about someone who just blew into town with $300 and a gleam in his eye. All right, but look, do I have to pretend I think this is the cultural center of America? No, no. All you got to do is stop pretending you don't want what this town can give you. I'm not quite sure what it can give me. Well, I can sum it up for you very quickly. Oh, excuse me, gentlemen. Have you decided what you want? Yeah, two steak sandwiches. Yes, sir. Well, that was the way it began. I got Kenny signed with an agent and he started making the rounds. The first month, it was absolute murder. He got nowhere. He kept thinking his agent should get him work and I had to explain that agents aren't like that. You get the work and then they argue a little about price. As often as not, they lose the argument, but never the 10%. So, agents. <laughs> Well, anyway, about six weeks ago, the man I worked for, Billy Merrill, bought the movie rights to a novel that was very hot. He told me to read it and start work on a screen treatment, which I did. Also, what I did was get a great idea. I sprung it on Billy at the next conference we had. Well, has this guy got any film? No, no, he's brand new out here. I met him in New York. He's great. Oh, a friend of yours? Yeah, I know his work, and all of a sudden he pops up here. I think we ought to give him a try. Yeah, well, this, this role of the lawyer is pretty big. In the novel. Yeah, yeah, but the trial's about half the picture. Well, the time during the trial, yes, but you would be in that courtroom ten minutes. All uh, right. I don't know, Bob. Well, you're going to test for the role anyway. Oh, Billy, why not give him a chance? Hmm. Uh, what's his name? Kenneth Lewis. Kenneth Lewis. Well, Okay. Get a hold of him. I called Kenny and he came out to the house that night so excited that he couldn't see straight. After dinner, we sat in the living room and went over the courtroom scene, over and over it. And a funny thing happened. Uh, let me try it again. Huh? All right, now let's go from the middle of page seven. I'll read the witness. Yeah. You know, that's what's wrong with this thing, the witness. Well, I don't claim to be a female impersonator. Oh, no, no. I mean, the way it's written. Well, it's right out of the novel. But it's wrong. It's wrong. The girl is supposed to be in love with the defendant. 
Well, she's supposed to fight the prosecutor. Well, there's no fight here. Kenny, those are the sides that you're going to have to do. But nobody in the world can bring this scene to life. Well, you know that, and I know that, but this is how Merrill sees the scene. Now, go fight City Hall. <laughs> Nevertheless, somebody ought to tell him this just doesn't work. How would you two geniuses like some coffee? Oh, great, honey. Thanks, honey. Uh, Kenny? No, no thanks, Patty. You know, it just doesn't work, Bob. Look, do yourself a favor. Memorize the scene, come in tomorrow, and play it for all it's worth. Oh, don't you worry. I will. And don't try to rewrite the picture. That's my department. What? I'm the guy that tells Merrill when something doesn't work. That's what he pays me for. The next day, Kenny did his screen test, Kenny and three other actors. And that evening, after Merrill and I looked at the test in the projection room, we went back to his office, and I tried to help him make up his mind. Well, I... I don't know. I, I think those the first two birds are completely wrong. Well, they're too old. Oh, yeah, yeah look like the FBI. Every time you tell an actor he's going to be on the side of the law, he, he drops his voice an octave and puts on rimless glasses. <laughs> How'd you like Kenny Lewis? Well, him. Hmm? Good. He, he's different. He uh, played it kind of strange, though. Well, that's what made him different. I don't mean that. He, but he, he didn't play it the way it was written. He, he, he fought the girl. He fought her all through the scene. It sounded real to me. Yeah, well, that's what's got me worried. It, it was wrong, but it was real. Guy's got a quality. He's genuine. Well, you can tell he doesn't work by any book. Uh, I told you he was good. Yeah. I wish I could use him. Well, he's yours if you're interested. Yeah. Well, I, I, I'm going to get Tony Milo for the part. Milo? Well, his agent says he's free. But you didn't even test him. I can get him for a price, kid. He's a name. Oh, Bill. Oh, now, look. This, this movie needs some protection. You've got a potential bestseller. And it stinks. Who's kidding who? And stars. You've got two stars. Yes. Well, I'm going to tie on as many more to this as I can and then fix the story. That we can fix. But we haven't yet. So in the meantime, it's got to be the names who make it look good to the, the backers. Mm. Well, have you signed Milo yet? Well, there's no rush. I can get him. I think you're making a mistake. <laughs> it won't be my first. Come on, kid. I'll buy you a lobster. Every place Billy goes on Sunset Boulevard, they all know him. It's uh, Hiya Doll here and Hello Baby there. So when we got to this chintzy restaurant, I had plenty of time to make a few phone calls. Patty said Kenny had been trying to reach me since 6 o'clock and that he'd left about four different numbers, just prowling around town holding his breath. I finally got a hold of him and I told him what to do. Fifteen minutes later, Billy and I were still standing at the bar waiting for a table and Kenny came in. Bob! Kenny! What are you doing, chasing me? <laughs> I would have if I'd known where to look. Billy, you met uh, Kenny Lewis. Oh, of course. Uh, glad to see you, Lewis. Oh, say, I want to thank you for the test today. Oh, not at all. A waiter. You know, I'd be flattered if you had decided on me, but in a way, I hope you haven't. Excuse me, waiter, has uh, Eli Johnson's party arrived yet? What's with him? Beats me. Eli Johnson? Is that the Eli? Oh, Kenny knew him in New York. Is he out here? I wouldn't know. Yeah, he's supposed to have that new Anderson play. Well, maybe your friend got lucky. Well, he figures to. He's good. Yeah. Excuse me. I'm waiting for a pause. Oh, sure, sure. Um, Eli Johnson? Yes. <laughs> I didn't even know he was out on the coast. He called me this afternoon. Yeah, I, uh, I understand he's doing the new Anderson play. Nothing official. Well, that's why you said you hoped I hadn't decided on you for the prosecutor. Well, I'm not supposed to talk about it. Mr. Merrill. Okay, okay. But what if I had decided on you? Oh, uh, well, I don't know. That would depend on... On uh, what? The money? No, not entirely. No, there are a few things about the part itself. Oh? Uh -huh. Oh, say, Bob. Yeah? 
Uh, see what's holding up our table, will you? Sure, I'll be right back. Be right back. Hmm. I never should have left. But I played the old school tie right down to the end. I went into one of the pay phones and I called the bar and I got Kenny on the wire. And right in front of Billy Merrill, I gave him a chance to tell Mr. Eli Johnson, the big theatrical producer, that he was sorry that the latter couldn't make it for dinner. And, oh yes, he'd see Mr. Johnson the first thing in the morning. Well, after I hung up, I went out and I gave the head waiter the hurry up. But by the time I got back to the bar, the damage had been done. And that's, uh, that's the way it seems to me, Mr. Merrill. It's difficult, but in the writing, the part is improperly conceived. The whole thing, it's, it's, uh, it's out of balance. The head waiter says it'll be another ten minutes, Billy. Oh, I, I want you to listen to this, Bob. Hmm? McKinney just got a call. He's having dinner with us. Yeah, Johnson's tied up. I'll see him tomorrow. Oh, it's too bad. Yeah, now listen to this. He's got an angle on a story we didn't even see. Well, uh, the way the thing is written, Bob, the prosecutor's relationship to the girl, the heroine, uh, she doesn't fight him enough. Well, that's why Kenny's test looked real. He fought her. Well, he ought to fight her. We've talked about this. But we didn't do anything about it. Well, <laughs> Billy, you wanted it the way it was in the book. Bob, I wanted the flavor. You wanted the scene. I wanted the scene to retain the flavor of the book. That doesn't mean I, I wanted to fall flat on its face. Now, you don't want to change it any more than I do. Now, what's your idea? Tell him, Kenny. Oh, well, actually, it's, it's a simple thing, Bob. It's so simple, I'm a little worried that you didn't see it. Oh, maybe I did. Well, just on the off chance that you didn't, please listen. Maybe you'll learn something. Go ahead, Kenny. I did what Billy told me to. I stood there at the bar and I listened. I listened to Kenny give a classroom lecture on the function and the nature of drama. A lecture of the sort he'd given the undergraduates at Michigan Subnormal for the last five years. Then we went in and we ate the lobster and the lecture continued and Billy Merrill ate it up in great big mouthfuls, the lecture and the lobster. It wasn't until the following morning at breakfast that I realized I might have to stick a pin in somebody's balloon. But purely as a matter of self-preservation. But I... Well, I still don't understand what he thought he was doing. Well, he thought he was increasing the value of his stock, honey, and he was. Well, he couldn't have been trying to hurt you. Well, all I know is he did hurt me. Well, it wouldn't make any sense. Well, Kenny's been hungry for a long time, and he learns pretty fast. You mean you think he's after your job? Well, let me put it this way. I uh, think he'd take it if Billy offered it to him. Well, Billy wouldn't. You're worrying yourself to death about nothing. You know, I don't know how you've gotten to be such an expert on what Billy would or would not oh, do. Oh, Bob, this has happened a thousand times. An actor tries to impress a producer and he goes a little overboard. I'll get it. Okay. Hello. Robert. Oh, hello, Kenny. You're up pretty early. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to catch you before you left for the studio. Uh, how do you think I did last night? Oh, you did great. I was just telling Patty. Yeah, Merrill seemed to like me. Oh, he loved you. Oh, and that was a great idea you had about Johnson. As Billy really took the bait on that, huh? Hook, line, and sinker. <laughs> Bob, is anything wrong? Well, now that you bring it up, yes, a little. What's the matter? Well, I didn't exactly appreciate the way you plowed into my story treatment in front of Merrill last night. What? The, 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 yes, yeah. You know, whether you know it or not, that didn't do me much good. Oh, Bob. Oh, holy cats. I wasn't knocking your treatment. I was talking about the novel. Well, I wish you'd been a little more explicit. Oh, listen. Oh, good grief. Bob, I was just trying to, 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 to justify the way I played the scene in the test. Yeah, I know, I know. I wouldn't do anything to make you look bad. Kenny, I'm sure it wasn't intentional. Holy cats, no. If it weren't for you, I, I wouldn't even get in the front gate. Yeah. I know that. All right. Now, from now on, if, if you got a beef about the script, give it to me first, will you? Oh, sure, kid, sure. Oh, my gosh. You know, Billy is a funny guy. I won't open my mouth again. Honest. All I wanted is the part, you know. I wouldn't be surprised to see you get it. Oh, really? Yeah, Merrill's pretty hot on you. Oh, Bob, I'll never be 
able to thank you for this. Well, don't thank me until your name's on the contract. Listen, I'm late now. Give me a call at work about noon, huh? Oh, you bet. So long, kid. I didn't expect Billy to get into the studio much before 10.30, but when I got to my office, my secretary told me he'd been on the lot since 9 o'clock and wanted to see me as soon as I came in. Yeah, come in, kid, come in. Hmm, rough night, huh? Oh, yeah, yeah, it's the olives. <laughs> you should switch to onions. Have a seat. You look chipper. I'm bursting with health. Health and inspiration. <laughs> you and me, boss. <laughs> Seriously, kid. I had an idea about your friend Lewis last night. Are you going to give him the part? I think so. I came in early this morning and ran his test again, and you were right. <laughs> I always am. The reason he's different in that scene is that he plays it wrong. Oh, hello. Or to be more accurate, he's right and the scene is wrong. Ooh, that sounds familiar. Uh, there was a flood in what he said last night about the treatment. Well, I had the feeling that he was talking about the novel. No, no, kid, we, we can't fall back on that. The treatment's not right. Well, okay, then, let's fix it. It won't take much. Now, that friend of yours has a good story sense, you know. He may turn out to be quite a find. Well, he may at that. Has he ever done any writing? Oh, Kenny? Yeah. Well, I don't know. I don't think so. I was thinking it might not be a bad idea if you two boys work together on the treatment. Oh, I don't believe that there's that much left to do on it, Billy. Oh, I disagree. A couple of things he said last night got me wondering about the whole line we've taken with this story. Now, you and Lewis are old friends. You ought to be able to work together. Well, it's not a case of being able to work together. Oh, let's it's a face case of... it, kid. I'm going to use him in the picture anyhow, and, well, he can pick up a few extra bucks working on the treatment with you. Might look like a better opportunity to him than going back to New York with Johnson. Well, that's a thought. What kind of money do you suppose Johnson figures to pay him for a thing like that? I look down at the rug in Billy's office, pretending to be lost in thought. The shoes on my feet were oxblood brogans that cost $27, and although I hadn't paid for them yet, the bill had come in at the end of the month along with a few other bills. I looked up at Billy and I scratched my chin. What do you think? Maybe three or three fifty a week? Yeah, maybe. Why don't you phone Johnson and ask him? He's in town. He'll give you the dope. Yeah, good idea. Where's he staying? You know, I'm not sure. Why don't you call that celebrity outfit? They know where everybody is. You can guess the rest. Billy got hold of the celebrity service, and they told him that Eli Johnson hadn't been in Hollywood for the last six months. And that fixed it. Billy knew he'd been taken, so there wasn't any job for Kenny Lewis, because Billy is the kind of a guy who doesn't like to be taken. I finished the screen treatment single-handed. Milo got the part, and Kenny hung around Hollywood until his dough ran out. I had dinner with him the night before he left for Michigan to see about getting his old teaching job back. But it wasn't the Derby this time. It was a little pizza place near his rooming house. Well, at least I gave it a try. I'm sorry things didn't work out a little better, kid. No? The break, some make it, some don't. <laughs> at least I came close. Uh, you came closer than most. Funny thing about Merrill deciding to check on that Johnson gag we cooked up, huh? Yeah. You know, I think I figured out what it was, Bob, why he did it. Yeah? Yeah. I made too big a hit with him. Made him like me too much. Well, what would that have to do with it? Well, I'll bet he called Johnson to see if maybe he couldn't do me a favor. You know, work out some arrangement so I could have both parts. The one he wanted me for in the picture and the one that he thought Johnson was going to give me in the New York play. Mm-hmm. Well, that's possible. Funny, huh? What's that? Made him like me so much, I cut my own throat. <laughs> I wouldn't be surprised if that was it, Kenny. Well... Thanks for the dinner and thanks for the encounter. Oh, forget it, forget it. Listen, I, I don't know what your financial situation is. Oh, I've got enough to get back to school with. Sure there won't be any trouble about the job? Oh, no, no. They'll want me even more now. Now I've had Hollywood experience. <laughs> well, even so, I, I, I want you to take this. Oh, no. Oh, no, come on, take no, it. No, you'll never see it again. Sure I will. Look, when I was strapped, didn't you buy the strudel? Oh, that was a long time ago. <laughs> Come on, I'll drive you home. I dropped Kenny off across the street from his rooming house so that I wouldn't have to make a U-turn to be headed back toward the valley. 
And I waited while he crossed the street and walked up the steps. Over the front of the building, there was a neon sign that said, Transients Welcome. Kenny stood there in the light and waved to me, and I waved back. And then he turned and went into the house. It was a kind of fade-out I think he would have liked in a movie. All that was missing were the English subtitles. This is Ruth Hussey again. This program recently received a letter from a listener who asks, why doesn't family theater concentrate on presenting stories about the nice side of life, the pleasant side? There's enough sin and selfishness in the world as it is. Why must we be reminded of it on the radio, especially on your program? Well, that's a good question. It's especially good when you consider that it contains its own answer. You see, family theater came into existence because its founder recognized and squarely faced the fact that there is sin and selfishness in the world. If there were none but the good things here, it would not be the world, it would be heaven. And we have the Redeemer's word for it, this is not heaven. But it is a place of preparation for heaven, a place where we must struggle with the irony, the paradox of life, groping, sometimes grasping for things that we know will wither and fade, and yet which at the time seem all important. And in this there can be some evil, some selfishness. We are tainted at birth with the sin of our first parents. To deny this is to deny the Creator and the universe he has made. It is to bear false witness. But since few men are all good or all evil, we are able to hope for the best and obliged to strive for it. And a story drawn honestly from life can, like life itself, be highly instructive without sermonizing. The man who injures his neighbor weakens himself, and the man who steals picks his own pocket. It's there to see. A portrait of greed strikes a blow for charity. And, just in passing, a lifelike, if slightly unpleasant story of a home lacking love and faith can be family theater's modest way of suggesting that, on the other hand, a family that prays together stays together. More things are wrought by prayer than this world dreams of. From Hollywood, Family Theater has brought you transcribed Old Friends, starring Frank Lovejoy. Ruth Hussey was your hostess. Others in our cast were Gene Bates, Lawrence Dobkin, and John Larch. The script was written and directed by John T. Kelly, with music composed by Harry Zimmerman and conducted by Henry Mancini. This series of family theater broadcasts is made possible by the thousands of you who feel the need for this type of program, by the mutual network which has responded to this need, and by the hundreds of stars of stage, screen, and radio who give so unselfishly of their time and talent to appear on our family theater stage. To them and to you, our humble thanks. This is Tony Lofrano expressing the wish of Family Theater that the blessing of God may be upon you and your home and inviting you to be with us next week when Family Theater will present The Thin Red Line, starring George Nader. Peggy King will be your hostess. Join us, won't you? Family Theater is broadcast throughout the world and originates in the Hollywood studios of the world's largest network. This is Mutual, the radio network for all America.